Okay. Otherwise, I mean, there is a watch over there. That's fine. Okay. So, okay. So, um, so what I want to explain, as I said, is, is um, uh, coming from mathematics, and I, I will um, uh, propose an attempt, if you want, to understand the emergence of time. And this emergence would come from a fundamental notion, which is the variability. So um, I will first discuss variability. And uh, I will first no discuss, in fact, the notion of what is a real variable. So I guess, you know, if I would give you a piece of paper and uh, ask you to give me a definition of real variable, uh, I would get many times the following answer that a real, real variable is in fact given by set x and the map f from the set x to the real line. Okay, and many people would be happy with this uh, model of what is a real variable. But uh, if you think a, a little bit about it, you realize that it's not such a good model. And the reason why it's not such a good model is that uh, the discrete cannot coexist with the continuum. In other words, what I am saying is that if we take this formalism for a real variable, and if there is a, a continuous variable, then it's pretty obvious that if there exists a continuous variable, then the cardinality of the set X has to be a continuum. Okay, and if the cardinality of the set X is a continuum, then it means that any other variable on the same set x, so if I take another variable x goes to r, uh, then if that variable g happens to be discrete, namely take only a countable set of values, then some of these values would have to have infinite multiplicity and not only countable infinite multiplicity, but in fact uncountable infinite multiplicity. So this means that this formalism, as good as it looks at first sight, is in fact excluding the coexistence of continuous variables with uh, uh, discrete variables. So at first this looks very bothering, but it turns out that this problem has a beautiful solution, and that this solution has been is given by the quantum formalism, as written by von Neumann. Okay, because when you take the formalism of quantum mechanics, I mean the one as written by von Neumann, then you find out immediately that a real variable shouldn't be thought of as a map from a set X to the real line, but it should be thought of as a self-adjoint operator. In Hilbert space, of course in Hilbert space. I mean, when I say in Hilbert space, we all know that there is only one Hilbert space. And it is precisely this fact, the fact that there is only one Hilbert space, which makes a coexistence possible because, for instance, we can take the Hilbert space L of L2 functions on the interval 0, 1, in which we have the obvious variable x, which is a continuous variable. But this Hilbert space is the same as the Hilbert space little l2 of the integers. And uh, in that Hilbert space, we have the variable n, which is a discrete variable. So what we see, what we see, First of all, is that the Hilbert space formalism, the formalism of quantum mechanics, actually supports entirely the good notion of real variable because, for instance, the set of values of a variable is a spectrum of the corresponding operator. <coughs> the number of times a value is reached is a spectral multiplicity, which is uh, an integer. And moreover, now we have an enormous plus, which is that continuous variables coexist with discrete variables. There is only one nuance, which happens immediately, and that nuance is that a continuous variable cannot commute with a discrete variable. They cannot commute because if they would commute, there would exist a common x for both of them, and this is impossible. Okay, so the proof is well nine that they cannot commute. And uh, so what we find out then, we find out that um, if one is led, if one simply lets oneself to be, you know, led by this uh, uh, fact, one uh, discovers the following. One discovers that, uh, so I, I will go, I will 
not show you too many slides. I will, I will go directly to the slide which interests me. And uh, this is a quantum formalism, OK? And the fact that uh, the discrete and continuous can actually coexist. And, and uh, now I want to show you, but now I want to show you a statement which I found when I was going to the Euler Institute for uh, uh, an anniversary of Euler. And uh, uh, there was a booklet which was distributed. And uh, I was quite amazed to find a statement by Newton uh, when Newton was defining infinitesimals. He, he, he was not like Leibniz trying to define an infinitesimal as, as a quantity which is infinitesimal. He was defining an infinitesimal as a variable. And he was defining an infinitesimal variable. So what Newton was saying, first of all, he was saying in a certain problem, a variable is a quantity that takes an infinite number of values which are quite determined by this problem and are arranged in a definite order. And then he was saying a variable is called infinitesimal if among its particular values one can be found such that this value itself and all following it are smaller in absolute values than an arbitrary given number. Now you have to reflect a little bit. Of course, this phrase looks a little bit like obscure. But when you think about it and you translate it in terms of the formalism of quantum mechanics, then you find exactly the definition of <coughs> compact operators. So that uh, if you want uh, Newton infinitesimals, the Newton infinitesimals, they become compact operators. And I mean, if you know analysis, you know that compact operators share exactly the naive properties of infinitesimal, they form an ideal among operators and so on. Moreover, they, they have an order. Namely, for instance, an infinitesimal has order one if its eigenvalues are like one over n. Or the characteristic values, nth one is like one over n. And it has order alpha if it's behaving like one over n to the power alpha. And so you find out that these orders combine in the correct way that if you multiply an infinitesimal of order alpha with another, another one of order beta, you get something of order alpha plus beta. And then you wonder, what about the integration? And it turns out that uh, there is a universal integral, which is defined on these infinitesimals. And that was found uh, in the 60s by Dixmier. And so this is uh, the Dixmier trace. <laughs> and uh, so this, uh, this integral, I mean, if, one has to have some convergence that it exists, but the integral of an infinitesimal of order one, it will be essentially, if you want, the coefficient, the coefficient of log lambda when you take the trace of t in the trace of t, but you truncate the trace at lambda. So it's the coefficient of the logarithmic divergence, see? And it turns out that uh, if you think carefully and all that, you'll find out that all the integrals we know can actually be written in that way. But now there is a meaning for both the integration symbol and the infinitesimal. They are, they are separated. Normally, when you write down an integral, you have a meaning for the package for integral of f of x dx. But here, you have a meaning for the integral, and you have a meaning for dx. Okay? So uh, I don't know where I wrote that in the, in the slides. Yeah, so these are the infinitesimals, exactly. And uh, now, you see, what I want to think about is the following. So first of all, we have this notion. OK, so it is, it is the notion of compact operator. And uh, there is this filtration by order, and so on and so forth. And there is this dictionary, which I don't want to evolve on, but which is quite important, and uh, which allows you to go further in the calculus than one normally goes, where at the end, you have the line element, but you have the integral, you have infinitesimals, and so on and so forth. What I am interested in is not that. What I am interested in from the start is the notion of variability. Now, from what I said, uh, you see, the notion of variability sort of uh, leads you to the quantum formalism. The mathematical notion of variability leads you to the quantum formalism. And uh, if I think about the lecture of Thibault or the lecture of Slava, then uh, we have this Everett point of view and all that. And uh, there is something which uh, I want to propose, which is a philosophical idea. And uh, the philosophical idea which I want to propose is simple, is that uh, you see, I remember when I was uh, in high school, 
uh, not, not in high school, in preparatory school for, uh, for my mom. My teacher once uh, asked me to go to the blackboard. And uh, uh, instead of asking me to solve an equation, uh, my teacher did this. OK, so I was afraid that he did this. And then he asked me, what is the variable? OK, so I reflected, I reflected. And after a while, I told him, it's time. OK, so, and this was the answer that he was expecting. OK, now the topic of my talk will be the following. The topic of my talk is that I believe that we are all used, because of our constitution and so on, to attribute all the variability to the passing of time. I mean, this is many equations in physics are written d by dt of something equals something else. So we are used to attribute variability to the passing of time. The thesis which I propose and which I will uh, try to back by mathematical results is the following. I believe that the true variability is quantum and that the true variability is exactly the fact that when you take a quantum observable, it doesn't have a single value, but it has many possible values which are given by the spectrum of the operator. And, uh, and uh, uh, that be... <laughs> Once you have found this, okay, plus the fact that discrete variables cannot coexist with continuous variables without the quantum formalism, then you, you, I will explain how can the time that we know emerge from these considerations. And in a very strange manner, it will be related to the last talk, to the end of, your, of the last talk. Okay? But uh, I, want to, uh, I want to explain this idea in the best possible way. I have no, never tried. Uh, I know it's difficult. And it's difficult because in my mind it's backed up by an intuition, okay, which comes from many years of work. And this is the most difficult thing to, to transmit. Okay? So I will try. I will try. And uh, the way I will try will be the following. So uh, the idea then is that uh, we start from this variability. So as I said, at the philosophical level, there is something quite satisfactory in the variability of the quantum mechanical observables. So as I said, you know, when you are, when you are uh, pressed uh, in the external world, you think about the passing of time, but I want to propose something different. So I, I want to propose that uh, uh, whenever we make, uh, uh, whenever we, we, uh, we uh, look at some phenomenon in which there is a reduction of the wave packet, in fact, uh, we are wrong to try to write things in time. Because of our minds, which are logical, we are always trying to reconstitute a logical past, okay? Just because we want to, to feel happy about it. But what I am saying is that things are, might be different and that uh, there could be a fundamentally quantum variability. And what I want to explain now is a mathematical formalism that allows you from this variability to recover the time. Okay, so that's what I want to explain. Okay, all right. So, I mean, one has to be very patient and try to explain as carefully as possible because it's a delicate, very delicate point. Okay, so the question then is the following. How on earth? If you have this variability, which is coming from the quantum, okay, can time, as we know it, somehow emerge? Okay? And that's related to emergent geometry, and that's, uh, in the, as we shall see, the ingredients uh, will be uh, the same. So now I am going to show you a picture. This picture probably will relax you a little bit, okay? because what I believe is that the answer will come from somebody which is here. Okay? Namely, <laughs> Okay, namely, uh, 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 what I will explain is that uh, the work of von Neumann, pro suitably, of course, uh, 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 implemented and, of course, uh, very much ameliorated, but it is his thinking which I think will, will, will be the uh, potential explanation. And why? Why? Because what was von Neumann investigating uh, with Murray in the in the 40s and in the 50s, he was investigating, and it, his motivation was from quantum mechanics. He was investigating the formalism of quantum mechanics that he had put up. But then there was a question, and the question was, what does it mean 
uh, to have a subsystem. What does it mean if you want that? Uh, somehow, the Hilbert space in which you work is a Hilbert space in which you have kind of partial knowledge of, of things because the system is a composite system and there is a part of the system you know and there is a part of the system that you absolutely ignore. So what von Neumann tried to understand was factorizations, factorizations, and by this, of course, the first idea is that the Hilbert space will split as a tensor product of two Hilbert spaces, and that uh, somehow, because you, are, you don't care about the Hilbert space, you only care about observable or operators, you will consider, and this is what von Neumann did, you will consider those operators which are of the form T1 tensor 1, and of course there is a reciprocal which is the operators of the form 1 tensor T2, and uh, uh, von Neumann explicitly wrote in the paper, so this we can now look because uh, this is an important thing. So what von Neumann was writing, he, he had set up the problem of factorizations and he said another interpretation of this problem of factorization is suggested by quantum mechanics. The operator in the full Hilbert space, H, corresponds there to all observable quantities which occur in our mechanical system. But then, so this algebra B corresponds to the totality of all operators. But now, if sigma, the system, is decomposed into two parts, sigma 1 and sigma 2, and if we denote the set of operators which correspond to observable situated entirely in sigma 1 or in sigma 2, then he wrote down the properties of these algebras of operators which belong either to sigma 1 or to sigma 2. And uh, then he continued with Murray, he continued to investigate this, which he called factorizations, so, uh, I mean, we don't have to know much. You see, I mean, normally when you read about these things, you read that you have a weakly closed star algebra of operators. In, you, I mean, okay, so you don't know what is a weak topology or, and you stop reading, okay? But the problem is extremely uh, profound and simple as formulated by von Neumann. It's really the problem of factorizations, okay? Of Hilbert space or of systems, if you want, of quantum systems, okay? And uh, what von Neumann then found by investigating for several years with Murray, what he found is that uh, that's our problem of solving this factorization corresponds to the quantum mechanical problem of dividing a system into two subsystems. Uh, and then he said, at first, you know, the interpretation suggests, of course, strongly that uh, it should be possible to describe the Hilbert space as a space of functions of two variables, f of x and y, okay, which are square integrable, and where the sigma 1 would correspond to things acting only on the coordinate x, while the sigma 2 would correspond to things acting only on the coordinate y. Okay? So that was the first idea. Okay? But the marvelous thing, the marvelous thing is that this was not true. The, and the, what von Neumann writes is that the fact that the surmise of paragraph 2, 2, namely this splitting, this very simple splitting, is not true, is therefore the most remarkable, more remarkable, particularly so, because certain features of the exceptional rings M seem to make them even better suited for quantum mechanical purposes than the, custom, than the customary B, namely that the full system. And what I am going to explain to you in great detail and with great patience is that this is how time can emerge, namely from such a factorization. Okay? What von Neumann found, what von Neumann found <coughs> is that in fact you have three types of factorizations. So in his work, what he had found is that you have the first type, of course, namely that the Hilbert space does split into a tensor product of two Hilbert spaces. This is what is called type one. And at first you would not expect any other uh, possibility. Okay? Then Moreover, he found a second case. And this second case, actually, I mean, this is, a, I remember when I was in Ecole Normale, I once was going around in the library, and uh, I found, I, I was looking at this paper of Neumann where he found these continuous dimensions, and there I was absolutely uh, amazed, if you want, because, of course, when people found something like that for the first time, they write about it in a special manner. And he wrote about it in a very special manner because what he had found is that the case two, what he had called the case two, in that case, when you try to classify the subspaces, which would correspond to subspace of Hilbert space if you had an ordinary factorization, then what von Neumann found is that when you classify them, they are not like space is classified by an integral dimension like you have in ordinary Hilbert space. They are spaces which are classified by a real dimension. And uh, that real dimension can either be in a bounded interval, like 0, 1, 
or it can also be in an infinite interval, which is zero infinity. And that distinguishes between what are called type 2, 1, when the dimension is finite, and type 2 infinity when it is uh, 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 in the second case. OK. And this was the situation for a very long time. Type 3 was all that remains. OK. And now some physics idea came in, and the work of Tomita, of course, and uh, uh, the KMS condition in particular. And uh, so, I mean, the KMS condition, if you don't know what is the KMS condition, and if you look at it like this, you will never understand what it means. But uh, uh, there is a simple way to think about it. Uh, first of all, you know, what you want to do is you want to be able to switch phi of, you want to compare phi of x, y, okay, with phi of y, x. Now, in the case of type 2 factors, you do have a trace, so you have uh, some state which satisfies that phi of x, y is equal to phi of y, x for any x, but not in general. And uh, what uh, Tomita was able to construct, if you want, was, uh, so there is this theorem of, uh, at first Tomita, but then Tomita Takisaki, if you want, which tells you that if you take a fundamental algebra, okay, so in particular a factor, and if you take a faithful normal state on M, then there exists a unique way of switching x, y with y, x, by at the price, if you want, of replacing one by sigma uh, i phi of, of x, for instance. Then you can switch the two sides. I mean, the previous, the KMS condition, you, you can think of it just for the value i. It's enough. It, it tells you that for, by switching x and y, in fact, you can think of this as being uh, essentially, uh, uh, formally, it's phi x phi inverse. Okay, so essentially what you do, you think of phi as being something which has homogeneity degree one. So when you take phi x phi inverse, it has the same degree of homogeneity as x and it belongs to the algebra. So that's uh, the theorem. That was done in 1967. And uh, we are still very far from the interesting point. And yes. Be sure I understand yes. the translation of the state. Yes. So you take any state? Any, any, any faithful normal state, okay? Faithful means exactly what you were written, that, uh, that uh, an operator applied to the vector is not vanishing, okay? Then there is always... There is always... Uh, uh, yes, okay. Okay, yes. But of course, it depends on the state, as here, okay? Now, what I proved in 1972, I was doing my thesis under dix what I proved is that, in fact, this evolution can be defined canonically without depending on the state. Namely, what I proved is the following, is that if you change the state, you will change the evolution only by trivial automorphisms, which are always there when you are non-commutative algebra, namely the inner automorphisms. Okay? So, so in fact, what happens then is something which is <laughs> really mind-blowing. And what it tells you is that if you have a factorization of the inverse space, which happens to be of type 3, Okay, not, of the, not at all of the trivial type, then there exists a completely canonical time evolution, okay, namely a one-parameter group, uh, unique modulo inner automorphisms, which go into this out M. Okay? And uh, so uh, uh, to give you some intuitive uh, feeling about it, the intuitive, you have to understand, first of all, that these factorization of type 3 are intimately related to systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom. Okay? So essentially, if you want to get a mental picture, you have to imagine that the factorization of type 3 is like this. You take a, a, a factorization of 4 by 4 matrices by 2 by 2 matrices. Okay? But there you take a state. Okay? And uh, now what you do, you repeat this. So it's like repeating this quantum system many times. So you tensor it by itself many, many, many times. Okay? But to get to the limit, you have to know with respect to which state you are taking the limit. And the, so you fix a state on the first factorization. If that state happens not to be a trace, you will get something of type 3. Okay? And, uh, and the amazing fact is the following, is that now you would, you would think that you know, the corresponding time evolution will depend on the state and all that. No, because what, that, what will happen is that when you change a state, you only change locally. You only change it locally. You cannot change it at infinity. At infinity, it has to remain the same. And because it remains the same at infinity, it means that the new time evolution will not differ from the previous, but only by uh, something very local, which is uh, the inner automorphisms. Okay. Now, uh, of course, I mean, I didn't find this by accident. I found this after many 
months of computations because I had defined some invariant which was a period set of a factor and I wanted to compute it. And once I found this result, it could be computed in an incredibly simple manner because it's just the kernel of this map. <laughs> so in other words, uh, uh, these factors can have periods. They have periods. They have, uh, there is a certain subgroup of the real numbers where they, they don't move. Okay? And uh, these periods, in fact, I proved that it could be many, many subgroups, not necessarily discrete in R. So I, uh, already with infinite tensor product factors, you know, this proved to be, uh, okay, this proved to be, if you want, a, a very uh, uh, computable invariant. And, and then, sorry. Non-continuous. No, sorry. Well, of course, because the quotient is, is a, it's a quotient by a, a group which can be very dense, okay? So, so now uh, this led me to the classification of factors and to the reduction from type three to type two. So, uh, so immediately, if you want, it gave uh, uh, several invariants. So the first invariant that it gave was what is called a module of uh, a factor. And uh, I mean, this module is a closed, for that one, it's a closed subgroup. So this is a, 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 essentially the spectrum. And uh, so this module is a closed subgroup of R plus star. And then it, it was splitting the, the factors by further classification in the type three case which is the case uh, 3 lambda, if you want, where this lambda is actually a, a, an element of 0, 1, of the interval 0, 1. And uh, so this lambda belongs to the interval 0, 1. And what I proved, uh, this was in uh, June of uh, 1972, what I proved is that factors of type 3 lambda for lambda different from 1 are reconstructed from a factor of type 2, from a, a fundamental algebra of type 2, and not a single automorphism. Okay. Then after I did that, but long time after, Takezaki proved that uh, uh, the same was holding in the case 3, 1, but then you had to replace a single automorphism by a one parameter group. Okay. So that was a reduction from type 3 to type 2. But uh, what remains, if you want, what remains is this uh, completely uh, uh, mind-blowing fact, if you want, that somehow the factorization, which is not of the simple kind one, which is not of the simple kind two, it generates its own time evolution. So the operators will rotate with time in a completely canonical manner. And moreover, when you look back at the KMS condition, you find, of course, that the KMS condition is fulfilled by the Boltzmann state which is given by trace of exponential minus beta h when you take the Heisenberg evolution uh, of observables. Okay. So then there is something which I, I try to convey. Okay. And my feeling is the following. My feeling is that time, the passing of time, could very well come from the fact that we are unable to know all observables in the quantum mechanics. So I am referring, for instance, to the talk of Thibault when he was talking about the, uh, the, the formalism of Everett, where you have a single Euler space and you try to look at the whole universe. The idea there would be the following, that we are unable to control all the observables of the universe. We are only able to control a small part of them, which is a factorization of this kind. And because of our lack of knowledge of the full observables, we have the feeling that time is passing. That's the idea which I want to convey, okay? It's a, it's a rather brave idea in the sense that uh, what I am saying is that it's our lack of knowledge, it's our lack of uh, controlling the full algebra of observables which is actually generating time. And what I propose to do when we talk, you know, about all these entangled state, all these experiments in quantum mechanics and all that, I want to try that instead of thinking in the usual manner where we write everything as an evolution, for instance, if we take an entangled state with two in the EPR paradox or something like that, and when, uh, when we say, okay, we make measurement on this, boom, then there is reduction of the wave packet. But okay, what does this mean? I, at what time and all that? You know, this confuses me totally. And I would much rather have a theory in which time is emergent. And uh, somehow, if you want, it's, it's a corollary of our lack of knowledge. Yes.
But isn't this very similar to the idea that people pursue in, in, in canonical quantum gravity when you write the Wheeler de Witt equation? There's no time. Of course. I am com I'm no coming. I am, I am coming to that. I am coming to that. I am coming to that because, you know, for many years, of course, after doing my thesis, I was fasc fascinated by this idea. And I was fascinated by the possibility that it could have a link with physics. But, but uh, wait, wait, I have not finished. But I was always uh, disappointed because even in quantum field theory, even in the case of the Riddler wedge and all that, I was always uh, disappointed. It never, it never convinced me at all. Okay? It never convinced me. So quantum field theory was not uh, good. And then it turned out that uh, in uh, 1994, in 19, so quite a long time ago, in 1994, I was. Uh, visiting the Newton Institute because I wanted to learn about gravity. So I was there. There was, uh, you know, a whole program on gravity. So uh, okay, they invited me. I was lucky. And uh, then one day, uh, there was a conference which was announced. Uh, uh, and uh, the title of the conference was, We Know What Quantum Space Time Is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was by Carlo. Uh, Carlo is a very good friend. Okay. So it was by Carlo Orelli. And uh, the that was the title of the conference. And of course, when I saw this title of the conference, I went to the conference, but my gun was not even under the table. It was on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I attended the conference, and uh, okay. And uh, we, so we had a heated discussion. And uh, so after, uh, after that, okay, I, I began to discuss with Carlo. And uh, we were having tea together. And uh, the more I was talking with him, the more I, I saw that he had thought very deeply about these problems. So I mean, I kept talking with him until the dinner. There was a dinner organized in the Newton Institute. So at dinner, we were sitting next to each other. And uh, at some point in the dinner, I dared to tell him about what I told you now. So I dared to tell him, you know, there is this uh, time evolution. And then Carlo left. So he was sitting next to me, okay, and he left. So I said, okay, I must have been rude <laughs> with him <laughs> for some reason which I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, okay. And five minutes later, he came back, he came back, and he showed me two papers which he had written before. It was not, you know, like, uh, okay, you know. He, 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 so he showed me two papers which he had written before, and uh, 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 so what, what he had done, I will show you the papers because otherwise you won't believe me. But uh, uh, so what he had found, and uh, this is amazing. I, I find you know that uh, uh, for purely philosophical reasons, which are exactly what you were saying about uh, thermodynamics in general relativity, because the wheeler davids uh, equation is in fact a constraint of the system. So I mean, it's h equals zero. So there is, because of reparameterization invariance, essentially. No, no, but so, what I mean yes. is that the, the yeah. way they want to get time operationally out of this is precisely oh. to split. Okay, fine. Oh, very good. Okay, that I did not understand. So, but let me tell you what Carlo had in mind. So what Carlo had in mind was the following. He had in mind that because of this vanishing, uh, there would be no natural Hamiltonian and so on. And then he had thought about it. And for pure philosophical reasons, he had found that uh, the correct way was not from the sigma t, as physicists do normally, from the time evolution to the state, like a Gibbs state and all that. But he had shown, for purely philosophical reasons, that from the state, one should go to sigma t. OK? Now, OK. So he had written the equation, and this is his paper, Statistical Mechanics of Gravity and the Thermodynamical Origin of Time. And um, OK, I mean, I know what, that there are lots of things to say about it. I am not a physicist. I am not going to analyze this in great detail. But I was extremely stuck by the fact that he had written the semi-classical form of the KMS equation. So if you want what he had, what he had found is roughly, and uh, I, I should add that G. Martel also, had, uh, for a long uh, period, uh, uh, advocated the following idea, which is that, uh, I don't know if it corresponds to what you were saying, but I mean, uh, G. Martel had advocated the idea that, um, uh, after all, you know, the Lorentz invariance is broken by the relic of the uh, uh, thermal radiation for, from the Big Bang. So that somehow, you know, there, there is a relation between synchronization and, and uh, thermodynamics. So this is what uh, Carlo had written, okay? So this is very easy to see that this is a KMS condition, okay? That's very easy to see. And uh, then, okay, from there, he had, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
tried to, to go in the reverse direction and explain this. But to me, I must say, you know, I'm only convinced by the mathematics. And, uh, and uh, to me, this, uh, this uh, idea of von Neumann, you know, this idea that you have a partial knowledge and that you have a factorization, plus the uniqueness, because many people don't know this uniqueness. I mean, of course, you know, the, you know the Tommy Takezaki theorem, but I mean, the uniqueness is extremely important. Why? Because it tells you that you don't have to choose a state. You don't have to choose a state. There will be this overall motion which will take place, okay, and which will, for each degree of freedom will be corresponding to the uh, ordinary Gibbs state, but which will, which will be independent of which state you choose, okay? Yes. Uh, as it all sounds like people introduce a yes. of time using entropy, when second law of thermodynamics becomes tautology. Yes. In a sense, because you are forgetting about knowledge, for instance, when yes. you say trace this matters. Yes. Then yeah. you define for phenomenon. Well, you see, I, I don't want to commit myself to that. I just want to say, I just want to say a mathematical fact. The mathematical fact are the following. They are that first, von Neumann was trying to understand what it meant to be a composite system, to a subsystem, okay? And out of this problem, which is a purely mathematical problem, formulated in Hilbert space, nothing else, okay? He found factors, okay? He classified factors, type one, two, three, okay? Then came the time evolution, okay? And the uniqueness of the time evolution, which completely, if you want, allowed to classify factors, okay? So it cannot be, so the idea then is the following. Uh, the parameter T, you can say there is a parameter T, there is a one parameter group of things which happen and so on. Of course, you, you can be blind, and I was blind for many years, okay? Now, on the other hand, uh, if you take very seriously the idea that the origin of variability doesn't come from the passing of time, but comes simply from the formalism of quantum mechanics, from the Hilbert space, that's it, you know. Then, I mean, it's absolutely vital that you can relate to ordinary time and time evolution as we know it. And what I am saying is that von Neumann and all this work provide a solution. And this solution, of course, uh, depends on the fact that you have a subsystem. It depends on the factorization. If you had a trivial factorization, you would have nothing. You need a factorization which, in a sense, in involves infinitely many degrees of freedom. A type one factorization is a factorization which involves only finitely many, I mean, doesn't involve infinitely many degrees of freedom. You need a factorization, and you need to understand intuitively, this is what is the most difficult to explain. You need to understand intuitively that this time evolution is sort of unavoidable. In other words, because it, it occurs infinitely at infinitely many, 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 many components like this, it's, you, you cannot suppress it. It's not inner. It's not an inner automorphism. You cannot suppress it. You see, It has the amazing property, for instance, that it is in the center of the group of outer automorphisms. So it tells you that any other automorphism of the algebra will commute with it. It's canonical. It doesn't depend on any choice. Okay. Is there one yes. case where you can describe this? Yes, the, the, the simplest case, sure, the simplest case where you can describe this is uh, infinite tensor product. So you take a system which is formed of independent systems that you repeat. So you take a single system, for instance, a spin system, okay, and, uh, and you repeat it. Okay, Ising model, for instance. Okay, you repeat it infinitely many times. And then what you do is, okay, so you do this infinite tensor product with respect to a state which is not a trace, okay? Then what will happen is that this time evolution will be the ordinary Gibbs evolution in each of them, but on each of them, so it goes at infinity. So it is not inner. If it were inner, after some point, it would, cool down, it, would, uh, it would be the identity. It's not, because it repeats everywhere, okay? So the idea is the following. It's exactly what we are discussing in the talk of Slava, repetition. It's repetition that actually will allow you to see this time evolution. If you didn't have repetition, you wouldn't see it, because you would be in the type one case. So it's the factorizations, which are infinite repetitions, which give you this time evolution. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it, okay? So, Okay, I don't know if then one can go on and uh, take the point of view that Thibault was explaining about Everett and then say, you know, but what seems to be the case is that Hilbert space and Hilbert space operators know a lot, a lot more than what we think. We think that we have to add a lot of stuff 
with respect to Hilbert space knowledge and so on. But what I'm saying is this is not the case. And uh, tomorrow I will explain, this is the work with Slava and uh, Ali, I will explain that uh, for even for geometry itself, for emergent geometry, there is a very similar situation. So, so the idea there is, is to try, if you want, to, to uh, <laughs> take advantage of uh, the setup provided by simple quantum mechanics, but, of course, complicated by the fact that we are dealing with subsystems okay, and with factorizations. But it's very important to understand that I think there is a block, a mental block for many people, because when they talk about fundamental algebra, they say, oh, uh, I think most of the people don't even know the distinction between a fundamental algebra and a sister algebra. I mean, you know, they know that both of them are, are evolutive algebra with some norm and so on, but they don't know the distinction between the two. And when you think about the work of von Neumann, it's quite different, because von Neumann had a very simple motivation, which was factorizations of Hilbert space. So what are called factors, they are the algebras which are abstractly isomorphic to one of the two, M1 or M2. And it's enough to know them, to know the whole story. But I mean, uh, uh, if you want the motivation, is, has nothing to do with the weak topology, with, uh, with the norm topology or anything like that. I mean, the motivation is much, much stronger. Yes? But so if the universe was closed and finite, yes. time would not flow. No, time would not flow, exactly. What I, the, the suggestion, yes, it's an extremely strong, and that's why is this the first time that I give this talk. You see, I mean, the, the, the idea is the following. The idea is that uh, the passing of time is due to our partial knowledge, essentially. Because we don't have the full system. Because we don't know the full system. Then how do we single out this uh, subsystem? I don't know. OK. I mean, I am unable to know. But certainly, I, I would say that you know, it will, it will uh, eventually, I mean, so, so what is the next question? Then the next question is rather obvious. The next question is, what are the observables? What are the observables for gravitation? Because what we were proposing with Carlo was that if we had a suitable algebra of observables for gravitation, then we should compute the corresponding flow, time evolution, and so on, and then we might get somewhere. OK, and uh, I mean, uh, this would anticipate on my talk tomorrow, but what, uh, what uh, one finds, if you want, is, uh, again, uh, motivated by an extremely simple question. And I can ask this question here. I will not probably answer because, uh, because of uh, uh, limitation in time, yes. But uh, the question is, is remarkably simple. Uh, how can we say where we are? How can we transmit to aliens our address? OK? And of course, this has to do a lot with what are the observables for gravitation. And uh, OK, what I would say is that it's well known. But I have a mathematical contribution to, 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 to say on that. So I mean, it's well known by a, a little paper of Milner that it's not enough to know the spectrum of operators, like Dirac or Laplace and all that. This is well known. What is less known, because I wrote a, a paper about it, but as you were saying, you know, this paper was totally unnoticed. And I think I know why it was, <laughs> well, one possible reason. Because the, the, the new invariant, I called it the CKM invariant. OK, so what I proved in this uh, small paper, I proved that there is a complementary invariant to the spectrum of the Dirac operator, or the Laplacian. And uh, this complementary invariant is simple to understand. It's the relative position of two algebras. So it's the relative position of the algebra of measurable functions on the manifold. Now, by a theorem of von Neumann, this doesn't depend on the manifold. So if you take two manifolds, you can take a sphere, a torus, whatever you want. They have the same algebra of me measurable functions. Okay. That's, uh, and they act in the same way in Hilbert space. So that algebra in Hilbert space is well defined. And now this algebra has a relative position with respect to the, the, the algebra of functions of the Dirac operator. Okay, so there are, there are these two algebras. Okay? If you know that relative position, then you have the additional invariant which gives you the geometry completely. And the reason why I call this the CKM invariant is that uh, the, the Kabibo uh, Kobayashi Maskawa invariant is exactly the same in the sense that what you do is you take mass eigenstates for the upper quarks and you, you, you use a weak isospin group to put the mass eigenstate of the lower quarks up. And then what you get are two algebras in the same inverse space. 
and, and you do exactly the same thing. So, so uh, I usually illustrate this in the following way, that after, uh, so, so you have this unitary CKM variant of Riemannian manifolds, and, uh, and uh, I illustrate this usually by showing you the simplest example of the new invariant, which happens uh, because after Milner, of course, the counterexample to isospectrality was reduced very much. So these two things, for instance, are isospectral. Uh, these two things also, this is <laughs> due to Chapman. <laughs> but in order to show you the new invariant, it's, it's better actually to show you two other examples. So this is shape one, it's disconnected, but don't worry about that. Okay, so it's an isocellus triangle, uh, square isocellus triangle, and a square, a little square, and that's isospectral to this. So it's isospectral to a rectangle and a smaller uh, isocellus triangle, okay? I mean, you can play with it, you can find the spectrum, you will see they have the same spectrum, okay? But they don't have the same invariant, second invariant, and the reason why they have, um, okay, so they have the same spectrum. I mean, I don't want to insist on that. The reason why they don't have the same um, second invariant is the following, is that, in fact, when you look at this uh, spectrum, you find three types of nodes, because you find integers plus one-fourth, integer plus one-half, and integers, okay, in the square of the spectrum. So there are three kinds of nodes, which are clearly distinguished. But when you look at the possible chords, and I will explain what is a chord, so this is like the piano, if you want, on which you can play in both cases, because there are three kinds of notes. But somehow I will call something a chord if there exists a point at which the corresponding eigenfunctions both don't vanish. Okay. So and there could be three or whatever. Okay. So and it turns out that uh, uh, the the chord which is uh, blue red is not possible for shape two, but it's possible for shape one. And uh, so in general, if you want the new invariant, what it tells you, it, it's intimately related to the idea of a point. And the point in that view, which is spectral, is given by correlations between the eigenvalues. So uh, this, this is the idea. Okay, so that the points, in fact, uh, when you, because after all, if we want to say where we are, we not only have to give the space, the geometry, but we also have to specify at which point we are. And the way you specify here at which point you are is by giving a Hermitian matrix, which is the Hermitian matrix of scalar products of spinors at the point where we are. So you have eigenspinors, and you can look at the corresponding matrix. That will be exactly what you need to know the point. So, so I mean, okay, of course we know we have the, this. Okay, so I will finish here. I will actually finish here. And I will continue tomorrow on this uh, spectral framework. But, uh, I mean, I... I, I I always hesitate, hesitated to give this talk because it's an intuitive idea. It's based on uh, mathematics. I'm not saying that with Carlo we made the best use of this mathematical theorem. I mean, I'm not saying that. And I know, as you know, that in physics, you have to think a lot. You have to try to find counterexamples and so on. But I hope I convey the intuitive idea. Uh, the intuitive idea is that there are factorizations which are so so uh, um, with infinitely many degrees of freedom that they generate their own time, okay? And this is by partial knowledge. Namely, if it was a full thing, nothing would happen. It's only because it's a partial thing that something happens. And of course, it's related to thermodynamics and temperature and all that. Okay, so I think I will. Yes. Yeah. So let me return back to this question about cloth mm -hmm. which okay, is supposed to expand and then contract. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, according to your statement, basically mm -hmm. you cannot introduce in such a way time that okay, it would proceed all the mm -hmm. way. <laughs> From the beginning to the mm -hmm. end, mm -hmm. uh, what is the reason? Okay. No, no, but, let, let, no, no, but let, let me answer your question. Yeah. You see, uh, Carlo actually wrote two papers, okay? Uh, I cannot say I'm very convinced by the second paper, but in the second paper, what he was doing, he was taking a Robertson-Walker model, okay? And uh, then he was computing this thermodynamical time, okay? And then what he found is that actually there is, uh, if you want, there is, you have a, a temperature which depends on time, like beta of t, which, so the flows, the flow lines are the same, but there is a rescaling by beta of t, okay? So, okay. Then if you want the issue, uh, 
Okay, I, I mean, I don't know how to answer your question, but uh, uh, when I read this paper, I was a little bit uh, uh, taken aback in the sense that uh, he, he was putting by end the thermodynamical state. And of course, you know, in, in some sense, I mean, uh, one has to be very careful because in the von Neumann spirit, what is really important is that you have a fixed Hilbert space and then you have a weakly closed algebra of operators. If you had only, um, like uh, in the talk of Klaus, if you have only a uh, star algebra and you use the state to make the completion and all that, then you are not in such a good uh, situation because, you know, then if you change the state to another state, you will get another thing. So, I mean, it's very, very important that you stay within the framework of a single quantum. So, I think it fits with what Thibault was saying about uh, Everett, no. namely that the model should be you have a Hilbert space and you have a Okay, the you, you, you know, because yes. a single equation was considered by Brace David, yes. in fact, because yes, you understand that this uh, super space <coughs> approach, when you write yes. um, uh, first school, this uh, yeah, 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 equation, sure. there is no time. Yeah, exactly. Then you try to introduce some time. For yeah. instance, David was introducing some clocks from dust or whatsoever, so he was introducing some operators okay. Okay. which were built from the other variables. So then, Yes. There was so called the error of time. Yes, okay. On the other hand, okay, for the closed <coughs> universe, mm -hmm. wave function was somehow symmetric, okay, with respect to uh -huh. the bounds. Uh -huh. But uh, okay. he found the following solution in terms of favorite interpretation. He said that before we are interpreting the whole thing, we take the whole wave function, decompose it in subcomponent, uh -huh. then the whole picture looks symmetric, but you are getting universes where time in one universe goes in one direction, yeah. in the other universe... Yeah. Can I say something? You see, uh, what is very important to know here is that the direction of time is, is specified. Because what happens is that, uh, as I told you, for instance, you know, there is um, the periods and there are things like that. So uh, the reason why it is specified is that when you write exponential minus beta h, you cannot change h to minus h because you need a state. Okay, so this is very important. And this is why you cannot reverse time. So, I mean, th this, is, this looks like a triviality, but it's not. I mean, you know, so you cannot reverse time. So, so it's not true if you take a fundamental algebra that, for instance, the, the time evolution that I explained to you would be the same if you change t to minus t. If it were the same when you change t to minus t, then it would be trivial. No, no I see opposite things that yes. you cannot change because yeah. actually entropy, by yeah. the way, in each branch is yes. growing. But yeah. because you have many branches, then you yes. can have. It was the same story because the Hawking yes. was making statements that in this whole yes. universe, yes. because of CPT invariance, when universe will reach yes. maximum radius, yes. the error of time will reverse, yeah. and then all broken glasses go back on the table. <laughs> you see? Yes. But it was just wrong uh, yes. statement. Because yeah, yeah. The, whole, the same thing actually was faced yeah. by yeah. the yeah. I understand. I mean, uh, you see, I mean, I cannot, I cannot, uh, I, I, I cannot really discuss the physics. I mean, I, what I want is to transmit the massive Mathematical fact. The mathematical fact is extremely striking, I think, you know, that, uh, and it suggests a philosophical fact, which is not a physical fact, which is that the fundamental variability is quantum rather than the passing of time. Yes. So if I go back to the factorization problem. Yes. You started with a one line, yes. then there may be several factorizations. Of course, yes. And then there are different notions of time. Essentially. No, no, but I mean, because you have different algebras, of course. But if you give a factorization, there is only one notion of time. Okay, okay. sure, yes, yeah. But uh, how do you get this subsystem, I mean, physically or how? Well, okay, this is physics now, okay. How, how in physics can you define the subsystem which corresponds to the passing of time? This I cannot answer, of course. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, but I mean, if we take the point of view of Everett that, uh, for instance, uh, Thibault was explaining, then uh, I would say that, okay, you have uh, this uh, state vector or something, and, but, and then you, you only have no knowledge, or if you want, of... Uh, certain algebra of obser observables, which is not the full algebra. You have only a partial knowledge. That, that is the idea. Yes. Yes. No, no, I mean, if I start to make remarks, it's going to take an hour. But I think there are some, I believe there are some major misunderstandings in the story we heard yeah, about the time. <laughs> you see, the time doesn't come from a single algebra, it comes from funnel of algebras. 
that were embedded into one another. I mean, okay. If you have an equilibrium state, in fact, yeah. it's a, suppose you, there's perfect equilibrium, then Slava's quantum fluctuations never s form structure. It's yeah, very important that you're not quite in equilibrium. Okay, but I mean... Uh, That's what makes the time no, no. flow. No, no, but okay. I mean, but when I told you that it's unique up to inner automorphisms, it means exactly that uh, you have this flexibility to change it locally. So you can be locally out of equilibrium. Anyway, I mean, yeah. you know, I've made some proposals which we could discuss, but yeah. it would take more. Yeah, but uh, what 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 was my point? It was to to stress the mathematical fact not to stress the physical interpretation. I mean, it could be that for the physical interpretation, you need a funnel of algebras or whatever. But, uh, you know, I mean... Uh, Maybe tea time would but be... But can, can, can you clarify, in your yes. example of infinite tensor yes. product, yeah. you say the state on each copy yes. has to be, what, impure? You, you need any row? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, of course, any yes. Yeah, it, sure, it does it, pure, which is not pure. Yeah, exactly. But if it is pure, you have nothing? No, because it, you can have a pure density matrix which on the subalgebra in the factorization and uses something which is not pure, of course. No, no, but in your example of infinite tensor product, I need a row which is trace of no, no, different. No, no, I was thinking differently. I was thinking, fac no, no. So factor, for instance, four by four matrices as two by two times two by two, okay? Now take a vector pure in four dimensional Hilbert space. Now, this vector can be such that the condition he was telling in his talk is true, and I mean that it's faithful for one algebra. Mm -hmm. okay, that, uh, and then what you do is you do the infinite tensor product of the four-dimensional Hilbert space according to this vector. Mm -hmm. In that Hilbert space, you will have all the left algebras will act together, and all the right algebras will act together. And that will be a factorization, which in general is of type 3, unless the vector is a trace vector, which is uh, extremely rare. I mean, there is only one. So you look only at the factor. Sorry? So it's the factor which you take, I mean. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, so you take a trivial factorization of 4 by 4 yeah. equals 2 by 2 times 2 by 2, okay, and corresponding vector, and you just repeat it. You just repeat it. You repeat the same. That's enough to get the type 3, to get the time evolution. And the time evolution will be the one you... you but the time evolution is in the subparts? In the subparts, of course, in the subparts. It's not on the full thing, it's in the subparts. Of course. Sure, sure, of course. It's in the subparts. Sure, sure, sure. One last question. Yes. yes. If I understand that your definition of time depends on the system we are studying. Yeah. So have you an idea of the correlation between the two different systems that are... Well, okay, okay, okay sure. Okay, that's, that's, that's a very good question. It, it can happen, of course, that the subsystem is invariant under the time evolution of the bigger system, in which case the restriction of the, that time evolution will be the right one. That can happen, and I suppose this is what you got in mind. Okay, this can happen, of course, but it's rare, it's very rare. I mean, in general, if you take uh, you know, a sub-factor of something, it will not be, uh, the, the time evolution will not restrict at all, not at all. By the way, I should say you know, that, uh, of course, this was the motivation why then, you know, I spent many years studying uh, non-commutative geometry. And why? Because these factorizations, the simplest origin, geometric origin of this factorization of von Neumann is foliations. If you take foliation of a manifold, you get a factorization of a von Neumann. And, uh, and the simplest foliation, well, simplest, if you take, for instance, the O-cycle geodesic foliation on the sphere bundle of a Riemann surface, you get type 3-1. So you, you really get, you know, the most exotic uh, factorization of von Neumann. Discussion to tea. Thank you.